Friday booktube welcome back to my channel it is Friday November 22nd I'm here to do a quick Friday reads check-in since my last Friday reads video I've posted a reading vlog I hope that you've been watching my reading vlogs I love making them I hope you love watching them too so if you watch that video you'll know the book that I finished since my last Friday reads video if you haven't then I'll post the link down below so you could go watch it but the book that I finished since my last Friday reads video was Into Thin Air by John Krakauer in this one Krakauer outlined his experience climbing Mount Everest in 1996 he talks about how he came to that excursion in the first place, having been assigned to write an article for a magazine. And even though the magazine had initially just asked him to go to base camp and write about other people climbing the summit, he decided that even though he had said it wasn't his dream to climb Everest, that he really wanted to do it. So he asked for time to prepare. And this experience was the kind of thing that you can't prepare for because he belonged to a group, a small group of people who were being hosted, being guided to climb this mountain by an expert. And he talked about the different groups that were climbing at the same time, how he came to join one group as opposed to the other. But spoiler alert or non-spoiler, because if you know anything about this book, you know about what happened, then you also know that a lot of the people who went up this mountain, who went up to the, the summit, they didn't return alive. And in this book, Krakow outlined how that happened, how these guides, these experts at Mount Everest, how they might have lost their lives, some of the compromises that they made in order to try to give their clients the experience of actually conquering the mountain and how that ambition might have been to their detriment, both for the guide and for the client. And this was such a heartbreaking read because, you know, it's a memoir. And the person who's writing this lived through this tragedy that he's explaining to us. And while he's trying to become intimate with the reader and trying to explore what happened, maybe for his own catharsis, but also to try to share with the reader what exactly happened, how things might have happened. He also got a lot of backlash for his speculation on other people's thoughts, other people's motives for why they did what they did. So this was a really fascinating read. I don't want to use that word because it's not a good fascination. Hey baby, <laughs> the baby's here. You were supposed to be sleeping. You remember when we read this book together? You do. It's like that book again. We spent so much time with that book. Yes, mommy has to tell the other people about the book. So this is the only book that I finished. The baby is telling me she started hearing about it, so maybe you are too. So that was the only book that I finished. I started a lot of other books though, and I'm probably going to finish this one today. So I'll tell you about it. 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. This is one of the books that I chose to read this week for Buzzwordathon because this week is the readathon to read books that have numbers in the title. I chose three nonfiction books to participate. So this is one of them. Okay. I took off your cover, right? Or you took it off. You kicked it off. 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. There was a movie adaptation that was released a few years ago. It won awards. I think the actor might have won an award. I don't remember if the movie itself. What happened? Your foot? No, you're just letting people know that you're here? You want them to see you? You want them to see you before you go to sleep? Come. Let them see you before you go to sleep. Wee. <laughs> nope. Mm -mm. That's as much as you're going to get from her. She is trying to make a table for herself to put her face on so she could go to sleep. You going to sleep. Okay, we'll see you later. So the book that I'm reading right now and will probably finish today because I'm about two thirds of the way in and I'll probably read it when this little one is sleeping. 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. This is a memoir of a man who was born a free man in the 1800s in New York and he was kidnapped and sold into slavery to the South and he spent 12 years being a slave before he was returned to his life of freedom. And even though I watched the movie, I know what the story is about. It was still heart-wrenching to read this narrative. How this man talks about his experience, how he talks about the people that he met while he was being kidnapped, while he was being transported during his years serving as a slave. He even speaks highly of slave owners. He talks about his first owner, I think it was. 
he called this man a Christian. He said that this man, if he believed that what he was doing was wrong, he would have probably freed the people who were his chattel. But, you know, he doesn't fault this person for his ignorance and he speaks about how he was kind to his, to his property as much as he thought that he could be kind to them. And so I thought that this was a really even recollection of this man's experience. Like he doesn't blame people or he doesn't hold them accountable for what he knows that they don't know. And I thought that that was a really mature approach for him to take. I like that at the back of the book, there is an appendix that includes some of the letters and depositions that were offered on behalf of Solomon Northup. During his 12 year captivity, it shows how the people who were back home were fighting for his release and for his freedom. And so while most of this narrative details what Northup himself was going through during this period, it also shows what was happening at the other end. And so it gives a more complete picture of what it would have been like when someone was kidnapped, you get to see their experience, but you also get to see how other people, the people who they left back home were fighting for them to come back. And I thought that this was such a fascinating read. I'm not finished. I have about a hundred pages left to read today, but I did skip to the end and see the appendix because, you know, it gives these little footnotes in the, in the narrative and I wanted to see what was at the end. And I like this book. I really like this book. So that's the first book that I am about to finish for the Buzzword Readathon. I'm not finished yet, but I probably will be finished today or at least sometime over the weekend. You'll see that in the vlog. The next book that I started this week for Buzzwordathon is The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. And I'm reading this one because of Buzzwordathon because it has a thousand in the title. But it's also a nonfiction book. It's on my nonfiction November TBR. And I think this also fits with my Gone with the Book TBR, but in any case, I'm, I'm reading it. I'm finally reading it. It's been on my shelves for so long. And in this one, Joseph Campbell explores the idea of the monomyth, how a lot of religious stories and also mythology include the same kind of story. And the similarity between all those stories of the young man who is born to a destiny that is greater than his present circumstances and what he has to go through, the trial that he has to go through to to get to that fate, to accomplish that destiny, and what it's like when he shares his message with the rest of the world. So he talks about the similarity between Moses and Jesus and Jason, the, the Greek myths and the Buddha. I'm not as far into this one as I thought I would be at this point because I did slow down the pacing at which I'm going through this book. He's exploring a lot of stories and in part of his footnote, he explains that he's only really going to go through each story maybe once or twice, but he's not going to show how every myth, every religious figure, how all of the concepts that he's talking about applies to each one. He's using each one as an example of each idea that he brings out. And if you think about it, you can make the parallels to all the other stories yourself. I'm reading this one slowly. I'm not sure when I'm gonna be finished. I probably won't be finished with this one by Monday or Sunday, Sunday when the readathon ends, but I don't care. I still have it on my nonfiction November TBR and my Gone with the Book TBR. So if I finish this one by the end of the month, that's great. The next book that I started this week and I'm still in the process of reading is The Swerve by Stephen Greenblatt. This one also includes a lot of religious history. So again, I'm reading this one not as fast as I thought I probably would have, but I'm going through it and I'm about a third of the way in. And in this one, Poggio is the main character of this narrative. And he's an unemployed papal secretary because the Pope that he used to work for has been arrested. He's been stripped of his title and his privilege. And so all the people who worked for him no longer have jobs. They also no longer have the exclusivity that they used to have in society. And so Poggio being the Pope's right-hand man, literally. <laughs> Poggio is now looking for a new career, and so he's taken to book hunting. And book hunting during the 14th century means that he's trying to get into the monasteries, which is really the only place where books have survived, because these monks have taken the order from St. Benedict very seriously. St. Benedict ordered the monks to read, that they had to read daily. And because this is the period where books have disappeared almost, manuscripts have been stored improperly, and so they've kind of fallen apart, but also because books have been burned, you know, because they didn't align with religious thought, and a lot of the wisdom of previous generations were lost. And it's only in the monasteries that 
the books, the, the manuscripts, the scrolls have been preserved. And not just that they've been preserved, but they've been being copied in order to keep up with the demand for all the monks that have something new to read daily. And so Poggio, in trying to trace writings from previous centuries, has found his way into a monastery in Germany. And it's there that he comes across this writing, this, this very influential poem by Lucretius called The Nature of Things. And that is the poem that is at the center of this book, that search for that poem, this very inspirational and influential poem from previous centuries is what this book should be about. But I'm at page 100 and something and we still haven't gotten a transcript of the poem. But he has given us a lot of history of Europe and of religion, of the Christians and the Jews and the conflicts and why Lucretius's poem was so important. He's comparing Lucretius's writings with Epicurean writings. And I'm, I'm finding his reporting of this history so fascinating, maybe because I like reading about history, maybe, maybe because I like reading about religious history. But because he's doing such a good job of keeping me engaged in this book, I'm reading it a little slowly, but I'm also not doing a lot of other research on the internet yet. I'm waiting to see how Greenblatt approaches this. So these are the illustrations that come at page 116 and I'm only 10 pages away. So I wanted to wait until I got there to really go through them, but I know they're coming. These are some sculptures, the bronze Hermes, Epicureanism, a bust of Epicurus. This on the on this side right here, this is a rendering of Poggio. And these are religious figures. This is um, Jesus at his trial. Heretics being burned at the stake. Botticelli's Venus. And I think this is the last one. This is... Montaigne's signature on the title page of his heavily annotated Lucretius. That's the top one right here. So I'm looking forward to getting to Greenblatt's explanation of everything that is here. So I know I could go to the internet and find explanations of what it is that he's telling me in this book, but the reason I'm reading this book is so that I can get Stephen Greenblatt's take on it first. And even though I haven't started this one yet. I want to show it to you now because I think it's going to be a good companion. I have this book called Travels with Epicurus, Meditations from a Greek Island on the Pleasures of Old Age by Daniel Klein. I got this book some time ago and I've read through a little part of it, but I don't think I've read the whole thing in its entirety. I don't remember how I got this book a few years ago. And I think that this is going to be a good companion for the swerve. So when I'm finished with the swerve, I'll pick this one up hopefully sometime before the end of the month so I can add it to my nonfiction November tally. This one is about, so do you know who Epicurus was? He spoke or wrote extensively about pleasure, about seeking pleasure and the reason for life being pleasure. But it's interesting because Greenblatt credits him as not saying pleasure as in hedonistic pleasure or bacchanal bacchanalian pleasure he's really talking about pleasure from a more spiritual perspective and saying that real pleasure can only be attained when one is doing good and so in this book the author talks about pleasure of old age he asks whether it is better to be forever young or to grin toothlessly and live an authentic old age and so this author went to the greek island of hydra to explore epicurean philosophy and wrote this book about it. So I want to read this one when I'm finished with the swerve. So we're going to talk about that at some point in the future. But going back to books that I started this week and I'm still in the process of reading, I started The Prince and Other Writings by Nicola Machiavelli. And I'm finding this one to also be kind of a companion to the swerve because Machiavelli's writings or his perspective are either mentioned or alluded to in the swerve. But in any case, I I'm reading this one a little slowly. I, I'm i really engaged with the way this was written. The author is addressing a leader and he's talking about the difference between like an elected leader and one who has usurped authority. And 
what are some of the challenges to retaining that authority? What are some of the things that a person who's a prince would do in order to keep the people loyal to him? And if he had to fight for their loyalty, if he had to fight for their support, what are some of the ways that he can get them to love him? I'm not that far into this book, but I'm finding Machiavelli's writings very informative in giving introspection on today's political climate, what are some of the things that our current political leaders have done in order to sway public approval? This book is a really great read, I think, for anyone who is studying government, not necessarily as an academic subject, but just for someone who is interested in current affairs. So again, not reading these as fast as I thought I would just because um going through this text and thinking about what the author is saying, not just as a literary text, but as it relates to our world. And the only work of fiction that I'm reading right now is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. And even though this is a made up story, I'm finding connections between this and a lot of the nonfiction writings that I'm reading right now, because this includes some European history. It is set at the time of the conflict between Louis XVIII and Napoleon Bonaparte. And the main character in this one finds himself embroiled in the battle between the Bonapartists and the Royalists. And it is for this reason that he is framed and sent to prison. I started reading this at the beginning of October to participate in the read along hosted by Didi from Brown Girl Reading. But I fell behind and I started again and I fell behind again. So I started again this week and I'm hoping to read 100 pages or so of this book each day so that I'll still finish on track at the end of November. So far, I'm behind that schedule as well, but I'm making some progress, some progress. I'm reading it and I'm enjoying it, so even if I take that book into, into December, that's fine. The other book that I wanted to read for Buzzwordathon is Christopher Columbus' The Four Voyages, and I do want to start this one, but I couldn't start another book because I have so many on the go right now. So as soon as I finish 12 Years a Slave, I will start this one. This is a record of Columbus's writings, his own logbooks, as he was traveling through the New World. And I'm looking forward to reading this. So as soon as I finished 12 Years a Slave and made some progress in some of the other books, I'll pick this one up. Hopefully, I'll get through at least a part of it before the buzzword readathon is over. And so that's my week in reading. For the baby, we have Dr. Seuss's ABC, an amazing alphabet book, and I have been saying the ABCs to her. I don't know why she hasn't been saying them back yet, but hopefully soon. So we haven't actually started this book yet, but we will. We're gonna be adding it to our round of books that we read. I try to go through a book at least with her each day, and we're repeating the books. So the books that I've mentioned in previous videos, we're still reading those and I'm just trying to add new books as we go. We're going through the ABCs, like I said, but for her, we're still stuck at A for ah, 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 as she cries. Ah, 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 right, baby? <laughs> so ABC is probably a very appropriate book for her right now. So those are the books that we have around us right now. And those are our immediate reading plans. I'd love to hear from you how your reading week was, what you're reading, what's the most exciting or interesting book that you've read recently. And let's talk in the comments. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video. Subscribe if you want to see more. I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.